So Ruby is our customer experience director at Roast. Um, so I'll hand over to Ruby. Welcome to our session on how to leverage your tech to design powerful personalised campaigns. As I mentioned, I'm Ruby here at Customer Experience Director here at Roast, um, and I very much look forward to sharing some helpful and hopefully practical tips with you over the next 20 minutes. So personalisation, as we know, can be a bit of a daunting topic. There are a lot of buzzwords that we all encounter all the time. One-to-one, one-to-few, one-to-many, what does it all mean? Omni-channel, recommendations. Um, so there is a lot to consider there. And um, what we find is that brands often struggle with where to begin because it is such a big topic to approach. One of the scenarios that we hear often is when a brand migrated over to a new super wizzy technology that promises them a world of personalization sophistication, um, they've got the technology in place, but the teams are unsure on what to do next. If that sounds familiar to you, then you are in the right place. So what we're going to go through today in today's session um, is uh, covering off some practical steps on how to um, design some campaigns that will ultimately deliver you results, regardless of your tech stack and with your people as the main driving force. Um, so we'll be starting with the future of campaign personalization. So you can have a view of which data trends you need to keep an eye on um, and future proof against over the next few years. We'll then look at a practical step-by-step -step guide on building a robust personalized campaign strategy. We'll have a quick recap and then I'll open the floor to any questions. And of course, if you do think of any questions as you go, feel free to submit them in the Q&A box. So the future of personalization. As we all know, technology is advancing at an incredibly, incredibly fast pace. Um, John will cover off some of that in the next session, but as end users, it's very much hard to keep up with all of the wearable tech that we have got going on. We've got speakers in our homes, we've got things that we wear on our wrists that buzz all the time. Um, so it's difficult for us to keep up pace, but as businesses, keeping up with the change is even harder, as you can imagine. One way, the way that we consume the internet and products and services is, and the devices that we're using to do so is constantly changing at an exponential rate. Um, I was reading a statistic from Google the other day, which said that an average person, person switches between an average of three devices to complete a task, and they use over 10 channels to communicate with businesses. And all the while that is happening, consumers are obviously still wanting and expecting a personalized, relevant user experience as they move through their complex user journey with your brand. So businesses must keep up the pace. And one of the ways that they can do this is via designing some very powerful, complex, personalized experiences. So we're just going to take a quick look at the evolution and timeline of personalization, past, present and future. Um, some of you may know, some may not, but personalization was actually born in the 1980s, um, great decade, uh, when marketers began understanding the value of building one-to-one -one relationships. So gone were the days of spray and pray mass marketing, and they really started understanding the value of getting to know their audience and delivering personal messages to the, the target audiences that they were trying to reach and engage. We then move into the 1990s, um, in walks email, cookies, big data and AI. So as we know, email was one of the first channels to enter web 1.0 1, 1 um, and recognize the benefits of targeting, which is why people always go back to it as a channel because there is just so much value there still. Amazon launched co collaborative filtering, um, AI, enabling recommendations for millions of customers and cookies were born. Um, and what we really saw throughout the 2000s is that over time, devices, technologies, and user experience became more and more sophisticated. So in the 2000s, we have a mass adoption of computers, smartphones, and tablets, um, which led to the birth of social media and multiple other marketing channels. So just more channels for us to be able to personalize our campaigns on. But the data landscape, as we know, was becoming a little bit of a free fall. So in the 2010s, um, enter GDPR, which effectively has signaled the beginning of a privacy first consumer mindset. Um, and soon we know that we're going to be followed with the death of third party cookies. So what this means, if we're talking about the future of personalization, is that brands are very much having to shift away from third party cookies. Um, and towards focusing on capturing, harnessing, and utilizing their own first party data. So if you can, um, I would definitely recommend making time, you know, as soon as you can this year to look at what the state of your current data is, how much first party data do you have? Are you capturing it correctly? 
Are you consenting your data correctly? Are you progressively profiling your users and building out this rich picture of who they are? Because everything will um, sort of uh, come into play in 2023 when Google does deprecate its third party cookies. And that will be very, very important for brands. Another trend that we've seen, it's been around for a while, as we've seen, uh, you know, sort of since the 1990s, but artificial intelligence is definitely the next disruptive way that marketers will be focusing on on mass. So we've seen amazing technologies come um, come to the uh, sort of table in the last few years, and this will only continue. Um, but the ultimate success on how how quickly this gets adopted will depend on not just the technology that underpins it, but also on the people um, and our relationship and understanding of it. So upskilling and really getting to grips with what AI is, how it works, and you know that it isn't as scary as people think is very very important as we move into the future. Um, and then the final kind of line of thought is that as we continue to see mobile device usage just going up and up day to day, um, a lot of brands have focused a lot of time and efforts on web first uh, channels with regards to personalization. But you will see this shift um, start changing towards making sure all mobile experiences are personalized as well. Um, so that coupled with some interesting uh, innovation in augmented re reality um, is where you'll see lots of personalization efforts in the next few years. So with that in mind, I'd like to just move into looking at how you can, as a brand, build a powerful campaign strategy. I think a great place to start is with the personalization maturity curve. So some of you may have seen this, some of you may have not. Um, it's pretty much an industry benchmark, benchmark and standard of which you can sort of assess where you are with your current personalization efforts. So before planning your personalization strategy, a great place for you to start is to identify where you as a brand currently sit on the personalization maturity curve. So are you just testing the waters? So have you just started sending out single messages with no personalizations? Are you doing a bit of field insertion? So this might be dear Joe blogs in your emails, or have you gone all the way up through to omni-channel optimization, creating these very complex experiences? And um, perhaps you've been testing the waters with predictive personalizations. Understanding where you are now will help guide you on where you need to go next. Um, and one thing I will say about this is if you are quite relatively new to personalization, you know, perhaps you're sort of at the bottom end of the maturity curve, um, you don't need to fast track into buying a whole bunch of new technologies from the outset. Um, what I would recommend is start with what you have in place. You need to build momentum as you go. So prove your business model works with your current capabilities, then plug into or migrate to new technologies as your level of sophistication and end user requirements grow. So just take those small steps, roadmap your plans, um, and continually, continuously evolve your maturity to make sure you're heading in the right direction. So, and don't forget that curve, we will refer back to that um, further on in the deck. So um, what I'm gonna take you through now is a tried and tested method of personalization and how you can implement it that delivers results. Um, so we're going to look at the individual steps that will help you get on your personalization journey. And one thing I will say before we begin is do consider um, where you're heading in the future so that you can future-proof all your thinking. Don't just consider your current state or your current business goals. Look at, consider your future state. So where is your business going over the next few years? Are you going to be looking at international expansion? Will you be launching into new product categories? Make sure you keep that front of mind um, because that will ultimately help you design the best sort of um, uh, tactical execution now. So the first stage that we're going to talk through is defining your goals. Obviously, if you, you need to head in that direction, you need to know where you're going. So that's very, very important. Um, we'll then deep dive into um, stage two, which is defining your strategy. And then the final piece of the puzzle is tactical execution. So how you can get this all up. So step one, defining your goals. So it's very important to understand what needles you're trying to move. How are you measuring success as you roll out your roll out your personalization efforts. Um, you need to take a note of where you are now and what you're trying to achieve 
um, and how this improves your overall business performance, because this is going to be crucial to knowing whether or not your efforts have been successful or not. So um, typical improvements that you may want to look at are things like um, engagement and response, so opens, reads, clicks, conversion rates, and customer lifetime value. And I've just included some benchmark KPIs, um, just so you can consider those if you are looking at designing your own sort of goal setting for your personalization efforts. Second step is considering your segment. So next you'll need to decide which audience are you wanting to target and how will they be segmented? So identify users you want to focus your personalization efforts on um, and then start building out from there. You've got your four main types of segmentation. You may well have seen this before. We've got geographic, demographic, psychographic, and behavioral. So you may want to target by, you may want to personalize, for example, if you're looking at ge geographic by country or territory. Um, if you're looking at demographics, you may decide to do it on income. Um, if you're looking at psychographic, maybe activities, interests, and opinions, or behavioral, which seems to be the trend in recent years. So looking at purchase behavior, buyer stage, life cycle stages, occasions, um, engagement, which um, as we sort of dig into behavioral um, identifiers, you'll see that that might be one of the most valuable types of segmentation for you to use. So pinpointing any behavioral identifiers. So what behavioral identifiers would you like to use to trigger your campaigns? That's where you need to be thinking next. Um, Generally speaking, the more behaviorally driven your campaigns are, the more relevant and timely they will be. So, for example, did the user buy a product which signals that a follow up campaign needs to be triggered? Or has the user not engaged with your website in a certain amount of days, which signals that a campaign needs to be triggered? Um, if we take the example of Joe. Um, who is an avid shoe shopper, we can identify some of her behavioral identifiers. Um, so Jo here, she's a, yeah, an avid shoe shopper. She prefers email marketing as a channel. She's a loyal customer, shops on mobile during commuter hours, and she values fast, free shipping options. So building up that picture of your segment audiences is very important so that you can understand how you need to start personalizing your campaigns. From there, you can map out your user journey flow. So with your target audiences front of mind, um, go through, map your journeys and define your key messages and call to actions for each campaign. So at this stage, you can consider whether this journey can be replicated for all of the segments uh, that you're looking at or whether you need to design separate journeys for certain groups. For example, um, let's consider a personalized campaign. Let's um, talk about a new season launch email. So the key message here will be the new season has landed and here are some product recommendations we'd like you to browse. So this campaign should work for all the types of segment that we're going to be looking at for this particular brand. Um, and should we decide that we want to expand our business internationally, we can simply um, localize it by language and content. But in theory, the campaign should still work. So once you've defined your user journeys, um, and it's very important to look at what your key message and call to action is for each of those, you can then start looking at timing. So timing is very important. Um, here you are effectively making decisions over when the user expects or is happy to receive the communication um, that you want to send them, as this will inform your data requirements to some degree. So real time does take a bit more thinking power um, in terms of getting your data set up. However, it can be very timely and very powerful, um, but not all campaigns are required to deploy in real time. So for example, if you receive an email about reviewing a product that can go out at a set time, it doesn't have to be in real time. And um, so consider all of your options carefully. Um, of course, we've got the, um, the key sort of benefits to real time is that you can get campaigns out um, in, a, in a timely manner within seconds, um, but it is more complex and with batch timing, so set it at a specific time. Um, that means processing large volumes of data all at once, um, and it will set it will deploy at a set time, but it's less complex and potentially a, a little bit cheaper to implement as well, depending on your data structures. Next step is listing out your variants. So here we're moving more into the tactical execution part of the process. So um, you need to establish how many dynamic content variants you will need. So personalization can be done um, uh, sort of generally speaking in two ways. It can be done at an individual level, for example, based on purchase history or past behavior, 
or at an audience level. So segments, for example, if we take the example of Joe, uh, we can look at boots shoppers, hills shoppers, tra trainers shoppers. Um, you can personalize different content areas both ways in the same campaign if desired. So that doesn't need to be a blogger, but it's good to think about the two types. Um, and if we start building out variants for a new season launch campaign, we may decide to focus on product category and customer loyalty, for example, based on what we know about Joe as one of the segment audiences we looked at earlier. Step number seven is wireframing your content. So this is where the good stuff happens. So this is where all of your thinking starts coming together. So um, it's also where you'll gauge how far you can push your technology. So if you already have a platform and a technology in place, um, this is where you sort of start designing how you want that experience to work. And then we'll sort of figure out whether or not it is suitable. So um, if you remember the personalization maturity curve that we looked at at the start, now's the start time to start bringing that into life. So what can you bring into the fold in terms of filled insertion or um, product recommendations, etc. So if you start by wireframing your key messages, and this same process can apply to any channel, I've given an email example here, you can apply this to your SMS, to your push notifications, to your display campaigns, anything you want to look at really. Um, start by wireframing your key messages and call to actions as outlined in your user journey flows, um, and then layer on top your personalization criteria. Um, this is the point at which you can also consider any language variations by territory should you need to. Um, so if we take out new season launch campaign example, we personalize a campaign based on data that users like Joe have shared with us. So as you can see, the menu options have been purchased, personalized by Joe's purchase history. And um, we've got the first name personalized using field insertion. The product category new season launch video will be personalized based on purchase history. So in Joe's example, she'll see a video for new season boots because that's what we know she loves. Um, her product recommendations will be powered by AI. Um, the incentive at the bottom will be personalized by lifecycle and loyalty status using field insertion. And then there is a shipping message um, right at the bottom of the screen. I apologize, it's uh, cut off, which just says fast free shipping, shipping VIP shipping has been applied um, because we know that that's how Joe likes to shop. So once you've done the exciting bit of the wireframing, it's time to turn um, your hat towards the data requirements. So this is very important. And um, once you know how you want to personalize your communications, um, you need to consider all of the data sets that you need to get in place in order to power your campaigns. So consider any targeting and any personalization efforts. Um, and be as detailed as you can here because your data teams will ultimately find this part of the exercise very useful. So. Um, for example, um, in the, the sort of uh, campaign example we're looking at, um, purchase history recommendations and contact data will be what we need to power the campaign. Um, what you might find once you've defined your data requirements, um, that you might crop up against some obstacles, such as, for example, the technology may not be able to handle the complex data structure as required, or the data that you need inside the tool and technology isn't in place yet, and your data teams may not have the bandwidth to plug it in just yet. So if that is the case, what I suggest is sort of park anything you need to and work towards that in the future and sort of build out your MVP campaigns with your current data structures and um, capabilities. Step nine is considering your reporting structures. So um, here at Rose, we like to think of everything end to end when we're looking at launching new, uh, new sort of campaigns and initiatives. So always think through to the end, how are you going to report on these campaigns afterwards? Um, will you want to report, report on campaign performance by segment or on the overall um, campaign itself? Um, so preparing your user story of your requirements can be a really effective and beneficial way um, to communicate to your analytics team what you need to measure against um, so that they can go about building out the best sort of reporting suite for you. And then finally, um, build, test, learn, roll up and optimize. So last but not least, you need to get that campaign out there. So after piecing your content and data together, you need to build your campaign. Um, test the incremental impact of it to ensure it's performing as intended with positive results. And if it has been successful, then roll it out. Um, but your job won't be done there. You'll need to um, continuously monitor it, um, review it, um, you know, tweak it if you need to and optimize it as you go. So a very quick recap on what's been um, communicated today and what you've hopefully learned are the key takeaways. 
So start with a clear goal in mind. What needles are you trying to move? How will these impact your business revenue and build out your case from there? Um, then point number two is prepare your strategy. Even if your tech is already in place, it's never too late to do some high level thinking before jumping in. Um, it's good to sort of have that kind of vision so you know what you're working towards. Um, and then finally, powerful personalization always starts at the end. So ensure your tactical approach is built from your campaign design. Then test, measure, learn, roll out, repeat. So that's me. I think we are within time. Um, and if you can achieve all of that, you'll be well on your way to being personalization pro. So I hope you found that useful. And um, thank you all for listening. We'll briefly open the floor to any questions. Um, and in the meantime, uh, whilst we wait for those, if you would like to discuss anything further, do get in touch um, on the details that we've shown on the screen. Um, and if you haven't seen them already, you can find a range of our great white papers available for free on our website at wearerose.com white papers. Um. Oh, thank you so much, Ruby. That was great. And the questions uh, have been rolling in. So um, I'll kick, it, kick one off for you. What are some of the best personalised campaigns that you have seen? Um, I still really love the EasyJet example. I don't know if you guys saw it. It was it's a bit of an oldie, but it's still a goodie. Um, where they personalised your sort of purchase history to date and sort of it's very, very emotionally engaging. So this is your, um, you know, dear Ruby, you have flown with us seven times. The, the first journey that you took with us was to uh, Rome. And I just found that very interesting because it kind of connects with um, your emotional connection with your with the brand that you buy from um, and really used personalization in such a clever and sophisticated way um, to sort of trigger, trigger you to think about, actually, I did have a really nice time on those holidays and I should sort of buy again. Um, I think it was, yeah, that was one of my favorites. Yeah, I remember that one. It was a great, great campaign. Yeah. Um, and so do you think people should be worried about a cookie list future? No, I don't. I think they should start upskilling and talking about it, though. Um, if we go back to sort of GDPR days, um, you know, a lot of people kind of left it too late to have internal working groups and discussions as to what they needed to do. Um, I would find a few sort of data champions within your own brands and in your businesses, get a working group set up, even if you meet once a month, just to sort of talk about these are some articles I found, this is what we've got going on, um, and just sort of keep that conversation going. And um, what a lot of brands do need to be doing um, internally is looking at their first party data strategy. So how, if they, if you aren't compliant with GDPR, become compliant. Um, if you aren't capturing and storing your data in the right way, make sure that you're looking on that. Make sure you're building up a really um, rich picture because ultimately further down the line, if you fail to do that, and um, you're only going to be depending on all other sort of mediums to help you be able to target and reach the audiences that you need to. Um, and if anyone is curious, we do sort of tend to keep up with this kind of topic ourselves internally at Roast. We have our own internal working group, um, a few of whom are on the session today. And so um, if you ever have any questions, you know, do feel, feel free to get in touch and we'll always get you up to speed on, on where things are. And a slight extension to that question. So are there any specific platforms or brands that you think that you think will be able to benefit from a cookie list feature? Yes, there are some brands that are looking, um, absolutely, I think everybody's going to have to shift their approach. I mean, even if you look at sort of the work that Google's doing and Facebook's doing, they are both um, creating their own um, first party databases effectively. The reason why Google is sort of deprecating third party cookies is so that they can start selling on more of their own first party data. Um, Facebook is doing more of the same. Um, so that's why we're sort of recommending everybody else do the same too. You'll be in the best sort of place. Um, any brands that will benefit those guys, definitely the biggies will. Um, there are also some companies who are trying to be clever around, you know, in the absence of cookies, how, how do we sort of personalize? Um, you know, without without them in place. Um, I know that there are companies like Adlib, for example, um, who can sort of manage that personalization um, en masse without the need for cookies in place. So yes, there are some companies that, that will navigate their way through. Brilliant, thank you so much.